Radhika, we're so excited to have you talk about how educators can teach decades old consumer behavior theory in a way that is relevant today. I'll turn the time over to you. Thank you so much, Amber. And thank you everyone for taking time out of what I'm sure is a really busy day to spend, call it 40 to 45 minutes with me. I'm really excited to chat with you a little bit about how we can make consumer behavior incredibly relevant to students today, whether they are 18 and undergrads or the current exec MBA classes I'm teaching where students are in their 30s and 40s. Before I get to that, I'm going to do a quick round of introductions and just tell you a little bit about my background I'll go super quickly. I'm going to share my slides as well. So I'm sure I won't do this properly uh, the first time. So apologies for any tech issues. Let's see if I get it. All right, I just hit share and we're going here. Told you I wouldn't do it right the first time. Let's see, there we go. All right. I will make sure that we can view this as a presentation. All right, good to go. Please also um, interrupt me as we speak either. I uh, actually cannot see the hand. I might be able to see, actually, I'll be able to see the hand raise. So raise your hand, just interrupt me and just speak. I love to make sure we spend the next 40 minutes having a conversation as opposed to me talking at you. So uh, let's go ahead and dive right in. We are gonna talk primarily about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how we can relate that to topics that are happening in the environment today. Remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs is from 1940 and it is 100% still relevant today. We're gonna to share a couple of examples, one from consumer products, one NFT focused, and one social responsibility focused that really draw from the deep well of understanding and creating marketing to address consumer unmet needs. We may not get to the social responsibility piece given time, We'll see how we do and we'll go from there. All right, this is a little bit about me. Amber did a really nice job of uh, walking through my work experience and my background. I've worked at lots of different companies as a management consultant uh, or a marketing leader, both Fortune 100 companies as well as startups. I like to run, I like to teach consumer behavior. Um, and I have a wonderful two-year-old little girl. That's a little bit about me, um, but Let's talk a little bit about what you're all here to see, which is how do we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs from 1943 in a way that really is relevant to our students? So a couple of things. We all know the basic kind of premise of Maslow's theory. You got to fulfill the needs at the bottom in order to get to the next rung, in order to get to the next rung, et cetera. And Maslow throughout his career did evolve this theory over time, saying some of those needs might change based on environmental circumstances. It's not so pedantic. He also mentioned you might go for, you might be doing something to fulfill multiple needs. But basically, this is the theory. Start at the bottom of the ladder, work your way up, fulfill one rung at a time. Um, that, that's the premise of the theory that I'm sure we all teach. But a couple of things to point out. These are all deficiency needs, meaning they stem from a lack of. But self-actualization at the top of the pyramid is a growth need. It is not a deficiency. It's about achieving your personal growth, reaching your full potential. And interestingly, it's deeply individual, as we all know, particularly those of us that are consumer behavior professors. You know, listen, you could be looking at two consumers who have the same job, went to the same business school, and they might define reaching their full potential incredibly differently. So maybe I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of my husband who's traveling today. He's an investment banker. He might define achieving his full potential as accelerating his career and being a good husband and father. Whereas I do know uh, his boss, his sole definition of being all he can be, though they are very similar on paper, their resumes are very similar on paper. Sole goal was achieve all the success I can in my career. Small example. Now, it's also a growth need. So the other thing to think about is self-actualization. It doesn't stem from not having something. It stems from a desire to grow as a person. And once you get to the self-actualization top of the pyramid, the need gets even stronger. The minute you start fulfilling it, the need to do so grows and grows and grows. You don't come out of that. 
Now that might explain why some of us reach what we think is gonna be the pinnacle of our career and then decide that we want more. It's because this is a growth need. The minute you start fulfilling it, you typically want more. Okay, so that's the premise. What I love about teaching Maslow's hierarchy of needs is that it is so incredibly relevant today. So a couple of things. I wanna talk about two examples. One is from PNG and one is just about NFTs in general. Let's talk first about PNG. I'd love to ask the group a question if that's possible, but like what, what needs and what products, what products did PNG typically offer today? Just throw it out there. Yell, chat, something. What does PNG sell? Yeah, per personal hygiene, personal health, health products, totally. PNG essentially sells kind of products that are required to live your everyday life. They sell diapers, they sell personal hygiene products, like laundry detergent and dishwashing detergent. Functional products that typically would be positioned in the basic needs category. But what PNG has figured out how to do extraordinarily well, better than other brands and products is figure out, hey, which of the needs will spark the most significant emotional connection with consumers and position their products there, position their company as solving that need. So we're going to talk about an example of how they've positioned themselves as fulfilling self-actualization, and then another where they've positioned themselves as fulfilling safety. But in each instance, they fulfilled the need that sparked the best emotional connection that was the strongest that, quite frankly, like another laundry detergent, that can replace the product from a functional perspective, but cannot replicate that emotional connection. So how did they do this? How did they go from positioning their products as fulfilling these basic needs to fulfilling self-actualization? The first example is the My Back is Beautiful campaign. So today they have this community called My Black is Beautiful. And it has more than 3 million folks and that are dedicated to addressing social change and sparking a much broader dialogue. Now, PNG launched a campaign in 2007 as a way actually to change how African-American women are portrayed as part of our everyday culture. And it came from a poll with a partnership with Essence Magazine, where basically they learned, PNG in Essence learned three things. 77% of Black women are concerned about the way they are portrayed in the media. 71% said they're portrayed as worse than other racial groups. And 69% said, hey, that portrayal is negatively impacting teenagers in our community. That's bad. More than three, roughly three quarters on average of Black women are saying we're portrayed negatively and it's impacting our children. PNG essentially said, Okay, that's a, that's a problem we should be attaching our brand to solving. We should be fulfilling that need. And by the way, the reason to do that is because PNG as a comp part of it is social good, fine. But listen, we're all running a business. Part of the reason was because PNG made makes products that are geared towards this African American customer. And so what the company did is they launched My Black is Beautiful, which is a celebration of the beauty of African-American women. And really it encourages women to define and promote a standard of beauty that's actually authentic to this community. And the campaign is, you know, it, it continues today. It launched, by the way, in 2007. It continues today in different variations. But in 2007, they did a multi-city tour, advertising, retail promotion, event marketing, grassroots efforts, PR with the release of a discussion guide so that women in various communities could get together and have conversations about, you know, how do we make sure that we are achieving our full potential, that we're enabling our daughters to do so, and that people perceive us as such. So really that self-actualization need. They launched this website, which is myblackisbeautiful.com, and it had all of that information on it. But listen, Make no mistake, this is PNG doing marketing for their products. 
which target this customer group. This is PNG smartly trying to find a way to appeal to a customer group, which maybe wasn't served so overtly in the past. That's one example. PNG said, hey, we make functional products in the hygiene space, so maybe the, the safety space, uh, maybe the kind of general basic needs space. How do we create an emotional connection and help consumers reach that stage of self-actualization? They did so through this campaign, which wildly successful, by the way. Another example of this is a reiteration or like a revival of the My Black is Beautiful campaign from 2016. I'd love to see if folks can raise their hand and tell me who's seen the talk or any of the three minute videos in this series. Either we can't raise our hand or nobody's seen this. Either is totally fine. So the talk is a two minute film essentially showing black mothers talking to their children about racism, the racism they'll face in their lives. And in one scene, a mother says to her daughter, hey, this isn't about you getting a ticket, like a speeding ticket. This is about you not coming home. Each vignette that is part of this two minute video is based on real life experiences of consumers that PNG unearthed through consumer market research. Smartly, PNG released this during, a, during the show Blackish, which was on ABC, when Blackish was in its heyday. And the characters of the show itself were having this conversation with their own children. So they kind of, they created a, a message that really appealed to the safety need. They were very smart in wrapping it around experiential marketing to some degree and building it into not only an advertisement or a commercial, but also essentially what is product placement. I know it's not a product, but it's a conversation that was had as part of a TV show. Now in the months that followed P&G, essentially hosted conversations with community leaders. And they really tried to spark consumers to have this own talk with their children. Ahead of Black History Month, which was the following February, they created additional content and seeded it in local communities. This campaign, which was made up of a series of three minute videos that were meant to make that emotional connection around the safety issue, blew up in 2019 and 2020. Uh, so much so that at the time I worked at J.P. Morgan Chase, we as a whole company, whole company uh, in the U.S. watched these videos as part of a town hall. So other companies were starting to look to P&G to see how can we take a book, take a page from P&G's playbook to create marketing and messaging that isn't necessarily about our products, but hits on a really important need for the consumer and enables you to form a real emotional connection with consumers. So that's a little bit about consumer products and P&G. And again, how it really hits on this company has spent time building marketing messages that focus on the self-actualization need as well as the safety need. None of these are about, we make shampoo that keeps your hair clean. None of these are about, we make laundry detergent so we can keep your clothes clean. This is about figuring out what the underlying consumer behavior is, the underlying consumer unmet need, and figuring out how to use marketing to connect with those consumers. All right, so that's P&G. We're gonna move on to NFTs, uh, which are among my favorite topics these days. And by the way, uh, NFT's growth in 22, 2022 may not be as explosive as it was in 2021, but actually, if you look at April, May, June, we're starting to see trading volume pick up again. I don't know that it's going to be OpenSea is being valued at $13 billion again, like it was last year, but this isn't a thing that's going away, which is one of the reasons I love it. So listen, I believe very strongly based on 24 qual interviews that NFTs are just another phenomenon of understanding Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's grounded in a need that's being formed. That need comes from the purchasers or the primary folks who are transacting with NFTs, particularly in 2021. So this is data from last year, but essentially 
the number of wealthy individuals was growing. A 2021 report found that there were 56.1 million folks globally who were millionaires, up 9% from the prior year. And the number of billionaires grew more than 13% in 2022. If you're a millionaire, but certainly if you're a billionaire, in a lot of ways, it's not incredibly difficult to fulfill the needs at the lower end or the lower tier of the pyramid. Biological needs, food, clothing, and shelter. You can buy that if you've got money. Safety needs. Well, you can buy a home, rent a home in a safe neighborhood if you've got money. Social needs. There tend to be lots of clubs and associations and affiliations for people that are wealthy. I see that in my current role, by the way, where we serve a less affluent customer. And we were looking, kind of digging around to see, hey, what forms of community are there that are formal and scaled and big for a, a lower income consumer? Well, there's not the Peloton community if you are not quite so wealthy. There's not a lot of community, but if you are wealthy, there's a lot of community for you. And by the way, you can buy entrance into some of those communities. So if you are wealthy, you can fulfill some of those lower pieces of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, particularly the bottom four. And then you get to that growth need, right? Self-actualization. And self-actualization, unlike other needs, it grows. The more you fulfill it, the more you want to fulfill it. And I believe, based on that qual research, NFTs are just another way to reach self-actualization, as is quite a lot in the, in the metaverse. So think about it this way. As a wealthy individual, you've reached the lower three, the lower four runs of the pyramid. You've also maybe bought all of the pieces of self-actualization and achieved all you can achieve in the physical world. Maybe you have a home or two. Maybe you have that yacht you've always dreamed of. Maybe you're able to go shopping and buy whatever you want to eat at the nicest restaurants. Particularly in COVID, when NFTs exploded, a lot of the in-person things you could spend money on and experiences we could have, like travel and dining, that all went away. So where could we spend money if we were wealthier in order to find self-actualization? Well, in the metaverse, well, with NFTs. And it's so interesting because just like Tesla says something about your brand as a person, your personal image, an NFT, especially in a time when you couldn't connect with people face-to-face, -face, said something about who you were in the digital world, where you may have been spending more time since you couldn't go on vacation, since you couldn't go to a restaurant. And just scrolling through your social media, You'd find thousands of users with CryptoPunk or Avastars. And those avatars, that CryptoPunk, those NFTs said something about that person, that they were in the know, that they were a first mover, that they were tech savvy, that they were cool. Quite frankly, that they had money, right? Because you could afford some of these things that were going for tens of thousands of dollars. And well, if investment in your digital profile is the next frontier, for how you'll impact businesses and marketing in the future. I think there's a lot of really interesting things to think about. Everything we've talked about so far has been NFTs in the metaverse. You see that JP Morgan and other brands are opening up shop in Roblox and Decentraland, creating metaverse experiences that they're, they will essentially eventually monetize on. There's even a way in 2023 to use an NFT to gain access into a restaurant. So the Fly Fish Club is being opened up next year in New York City uh, by Gary Vaynerchuk. And I believe it is a $30,000 entrance. You have to purchase the NFT in order to get into the omakase room. If you want to get into the regular room, it's only $13,600 to purchase your NFT. And that does not include the cost of food. These digital tokens are essentially ways of fulfilling the self-actualization piece of who we want to be. And I believe they exploded in COVID because you were not able to have that face-to-face -face conversation. You could not appear on that yacht in your Gucci bathing suit. You could not go to that hotel and being in that hotel would be a reflection of who you are. All you could do was take up those actions in the virtual world. And so the virtual world and NFTs exploded. 
I'm going to stop talking for a second because we've covered a lot. I'm wondering if folks have questions before we move on to the next one. Tough crowd. Um, all right, we got a couple of questions. So has the information regarding NFTs been added to your CV book? I believe it has for the May edition. Uh, yes, it has in the May edition. Uh, Gratuity is not included as well. Yes, that's totally right. Um, and then from Scott, why should we view NFTs as anything more than speculation? You know, my research didn't focus on are NFTs a good investment, which I think, Scott, is where you're going. So I don't know the answer to that, or I don't have good data on that. But what my research did focus on is how consumers were behaving in relation to NFTs. And it was very clear that folks said, hey, look, it's a way for me to say something about who I am, particularly in a time where I have less in-person interaction. So I think whether it's NFTs, or it's anything that happens in the metaverse, these things are here to stay. It may be a bumpy five years while we as a world figure out what the, and as businesses figure out what these things are and how to use them. I don't, I can't speak to the investment portion of this, but I do believe there is this unmet need, particularly if you are wealthier, that these virtual world experiences things you can own like NFTs does fulfill. By the way, I am very interested in, well, if you're lower income, don't you want access to these two? Don't you want to see something about yourself as well if you're a lower income consumer? Interestingly, last year, I believe Walmart uh, <laughs> created a bunch of patents in this space. So I, I spend most of my day-to-day -day job focusing on a lower income consumer, and I don't think that they're gonna be left out of this either. There are companies that are going to figure this out and democratize it uh, and make it available for all. Other questions? By the way, uh, fun fact, I just uh, had a company reach out to me focused on NFTs. They will sell you an NFT of a sneaker, several thousand dollar sneaker, three, six, nine thousand dollar sneaker. And they then will produce that sneaker. It's handmade in an Italian factory. And you have both the NFT for your avatar, if you have one, for your shot through Roblox, as well as the real in-person sneaker. Fashion businesses are really taking off with this kind of either buy one, get one strategy, buy it in the metaverse and make it in real life and get it, or simply buy it to outfit yourself in the metaverse, which if you think about it as a marketer or as a product manager, it's a whole other business line. And all of this stems from fulfilling that self-actualization need, making sure consumers have a place to reach their full potential and say what they want to say about themselves. I'm going to stop harping on this unless folks have more questions. So interesting. Uh, Kitty said, NFTs can be problematic due to high energy consumption. The World Wildlife Foundation has withdrawn its NFT fundraising. Not sure I buy that NFTs are worth pursuing until environmental costs are addressed. Yeah, you know, I don't have good research or data on that very specifically. I do think the more that fact gets publicized, because wealthier consumers do also tend to be social cause conscious and particularly climate focused, I do think there is some truth in what Kitty has said. But last year, when there were no other choices for how to interact socially, without that data on the energy consumption being widely proliferated, I'm not sure people really knew or thought about that. Certainly, the 24 people I spoke to did not bring it up. Um, so the next question is, if and when VR shops become more of a thing in the near future, would NFTs become even more in demand than they are now? Maybe absolutely, right? You can imagine a, a time and a place where you can outfit your avatar with an NFT. So just like we buy clothes for ourselves, you buy shoes for yourself, you need, a, you need a purse in the virtual world. And in fact, companies like Gucci are very forward thinking in this space. Fashion companies in particular, I think, have discovered that as a new way to monetize their business. Okay. 
I'm going to move to the last one and then we'll open it up. I think we'll have plenty of time for Q&A as well. By the way, I'm really interested in when VR shops become open because I'm, I'm interested in if that's a way to democratize access to the metaverse. We will see. All right, let's go to transcendence and social responsibility. So we've talked a lot about kind of the five layers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? There was this other layer that didn't make it into Maslow's initial theory, which is called transcendence. And in fact, he wrote about this towards the end of his career. Above self-actualization is transcendence. And while self-actualization is focused on maximizing your own potential, et cetera, um, transcendence is really about making sure you are looking at things more holistically from the perspective of the world around you, looking to do more than just fulfill your personal needs. So just simply put, achieving the state of transcendence, it's not about you as an individual. It's a higher order that's really focused on maximizing humanity and harmony in the world around us. Okay. So you're a marketing student or you're a marketer. Why do you care about this? Well, this concept shows up more and more and more in everyday marketing. And marketers care about this because it's clear that consumers care, particularly millennials and Gen Z consumers. I just read yet another infographic yesterday about how Gen Z consumers are focused on buying from mission-driven brands and that they will pay more to purchase from those mission-driven brands. Um, listen, consumers are won or lost based on this in some cases. So let's talk through a couple of examples of this. Uh, Bombas is one. Um, so Bombas is the company that partners with more than 3,500 giving partners in the US to donate essential clothing. Um, they started with a one-for-one -one mission with socks. You buy a pair of socks, we, they give a pair of socks. Now they've moved on to, because they have such a robust program, all forms of essential clothing. Really cool. And very simple to understand, by the way. That's really important. When I worked at Common Bond, which was at the time a student lender, now interestingly a solar lender, so companies get pivot. When I worked at Common Bond, we had what we called our social promise, which was for every student loan we funded, we funded the primary school education of a child in need in Ghana. And this stems entirely from this notion of transcendence. A couple of things here. Number one, student loans are a commodity. A loan is a loan is a loan. And you're literally competing on the interest rate. However, 73% of consumers that chose our product that we surveyed after the fact, we asked them, hey, like, why did you pick us over, every, over the other lenders? Assuming the rate was at parity. 73% said, because you give something to help the world. That's huge. And it's just a testament that when consumers have the ability and mind space to care about the world around them, they truly do. Fulfilling that need for transcendence is a real thing. What was great about this is we, we as marketers were not silent. In order for a company to really appeal to that need for transcendence, you've really got to actually be loud about it. So we did a number of things. Probably the most exciting thing is we literally took our members, so people who had loans with us, and our employees to Ghana to see the schools we built with our money, to see the children who we provided an education with. And oh, look, this is the founder of Common Bond right here. This is David Klein. Um, and that was really important. Being able to explain the impact a consumer is making by choosing your product, how they, the consumer, can achieve transcendence was incredibly important. And then another example is, of course, Tom's. I feel like Tom's is the original example of this. And interestingly, after 13 years of a one-for-one -one model, they kind of pivoted and they said, hey, look, we want to make an even bigger impact. We want to invest one-third of our profit um, into causes that consumers care about so we can drive sustainable change. At the end of the day, this notion of marketing for social good is all about helping consumers achieve this state of transcendence. And in order to do that, you've got to have the right program. It's got to be easily explainable to consumers. So when we were, when we were doing the social promise for Common Bond, 
Take out a loan, we educate a child. Full stop. Very easy to explain. And then to the extent you can make your community of consumers feel part of the experience, for example, taking them to meet the students, taking them to build a school in Ghana, the more you are going to be able to bring this to life as a marketer and as a company. Okay. I'm going to stop. That is all I had on um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and the three core examples that I'm using currently to bring it to life for our students. I'm going to stop sharing and I'd love to answer any questions. No questions, it all makes complete and total sense. Tammy, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, I just started teaching this class uh, last year, so I've taught it twice now. I became super interested in it when I took a consumer behavior course in my grad program. And I have to say that it has, we have the most amazing conversations in this class with students. It's so different than other marketing classes. It's just so much ideas and thoughts and great conversations. And I have used the, uh, the case study for the Idaho Potato Company um, uh, twice now for their uh, final project to come up with their strategies and what just great, uh, great ideas. And it gets them into that uh, multi, uh, you know, the multicultural uh, frame of mind, which most my students from small town North Dakota don't even think about. So thank you for all the great ideas and the case studies. I look forward to the newer edition. Thank you for saying that. I really appreciate that. And, and no, this is like the most exciting thing I do all day. So I appreciate that. There's also an exercise uh, that the Stukent team has on NFTs themselves. Uh, and particularly, it's a case study with Sotheby's and how I believe it was last year uh, they and Christie's were selling incredibly high priced NFTs of people, the, the artists. Uh, so it's, I just feel really passionately that I use that theory in my day job every day. And I'm convinced that if we can help students really see that and how it applies to the buzzy topics that they're interested in, they're going to get excited about the content. Other thoughts or questions? All right, Amber, do you all have anything? We don't have anything. Um, we can wait a couple more minutes to see if any more questions flood through. If you want to tell the audience a little bit more about your consumer behavior courseware, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the consumer behavior courseware is about 13, I believe, chapters that focus on two things. Number one, the psychology components of consumer behavior, the nuts and bolts of the discipline. That's incredibly important. And I find that when I teach this behavior, uh, th this topic, students are interested in that. But their then immediate next question is, okay, like, what do I do with this? I work in business. I'm a marketer. I'm an X. And um, I think that because of that, the textbook itself is filled with references to everyday applications of consumer behavior, whether it's things like NFTs, which were in the new May edition, or just like everyday references to companies that students like and appreciate, H&M, Sweetgreen, et cetera. There's also a simulation that was launched October of last year, I believe, perhaps a little bit earlier, and is going to be revamped by October of this year. Uh, it's currently several rounds that focus on enabling consumers to, uh, sorry, enabling students to think about building an end-to-end -end marketing plan and the consumer behavior components that go into that. And lastly, there's a number of case studies, exercises, test banks, et cetera, uh, slideware that go into just making sure we as professors have everything we need in order to really appropriately 
come to class prepared and excited. And I'm super open and excited for any feedback. I'm not a professor by training. So uh, please shoot me a note with any, any feedback you might have. My email is radhika.dougals. It's just my first name, that last name at gmail.com. I'm very excited for any feedback that folks might have. Um, and there's another question. What other buzzy topics have people found their students really gravitate towards? Um, I, I'd love to tell you what I think, and I'd also like to open it up to hear from others. So buzzy topics that my students have really enjoyed. I teach primarily at uh, New York University in, in New York City. So probably a small section, a, like a, a very small group. And I bet this group probably has a much wider breadth. But I find that anything tech related, my students really like. So we, we do three case studies uh, that are focused on technology companies. My students love anything that is Web3 these days in the last year that's exploded. My students love anything that's not in the industries I tend to work with, which, which is unfortunate. So anything consumer focused. So lots of restaurants, lots of retail, lots of high fashion. Um, but I'm interested in others. Like what are other topics that folks find people really like to talk about in this space? No takers, sports. Yeah. Oh, this is great. So helpful resources that Jim shared in the chat, Choice Factory and Choice Hacking. Oh, very cool. A, a semester long group project around the consumer decision journey. I think that'd be awesome to, to see and understand. Any last questions before we let folks take a couple of minutes to get a glass of water before the next session? All right, well, I've really loved spending a couple of minutes with you all. Please do give me any feedback. I, I'm really open to it. And also I'm very open to collaborating with folks um, who have great ideas in this space.